Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm John. Uh, so I'm going to talk about doing streaming data analysis online learning. And so really, just to give you some sense about this, my interest in these topics began when suddenly I found myself in front of the raw Twitter fire hose. And I was like, well, how am I going to start doing interesting data analysis on this? I'm now reading in multiple billions of tweets every day. This is just not going to be possible to analyze the way I'm used to. And so I started really focusing on things that I think if you have a sort of statistical background or, or even a machine learning background, you often sort of have not been trained well to do, which is to deal with extremely small memory constraints relative to the size of your data. Uh, so just to get a quick show of hands of a bunch of topics that are sort of going to come up, let me see a few things. So like, how many people feel like they're on top of the idea of space and time complexity? Like, raise your hand if you're like, yeah, that's, that's a totally familiar to me concept. Yeah, so this is like, there are definitely some programmers among you, but sort of there are lots of people who have probably more stats background. Uh, so what I mean by this is, you know, given that I give you n observations, how long is it going to take you to process your data? If it's going to take you a long time, that's its time complexity. If it's going to require a lot of RAM, that's its space complexity. And the goal of what I'm going to present is to try to talk about a bunch of algorithms that have very low space complexity things that require a very low amount of RAM, or more importantly, a constant amount of RAM relative to the amount of data you want to process. Uh, I'm, and the big insight of this is basically going to be do gradient descent one observation at a time. This is sort of the two, uh, TLDR version of my talk is doing that. Um, but to give you a feel of the kind of things, I actually thought I would just shine, show off this thing that I discovered the other day that uh, Jason Davies put on his website. I think it gives an amazing feel for the kind of stuff that I'm going to talk about which is sort of hacky but brilliant probabilistic computations that do really, really simple things that seem that they should be impossible otherwise. So this is a, a, a visualization of a bloom filter. So how many people, raise, raise your hand if you know what a bloom filter is, and if enough people here do. All right, so I'm gonna, so I'm, I'm gonna actually do this, but I'll go super fast so I don't bore the people who do know. So the idea of the bloom filter is real simple. I have this data set, it's streaming in, and I just wanna know Given a new item, and I'm going to memorize a bunch at the start, have I already seen this item, or have I not? So just going to say, give me a bunch of elements. I now want to be able to test set inclusion on a stream of data. And I want to be able to do this in a way that's fairly simple in terms of memory. So I don't want to store. If I want to, like, say, if I want to memorize 100 million items, I don't want to have to store 100 million items in memory. I want to store something that's a very small amount of memory. And the trick with the Bloom filter is very simple. You have this little thing filled with memory, and these are all just bits. They're either zeros or ones. And the question basically becomes, is something in it or is it not? So the trick is that you have a bunch of hash functions. So say I put in my name, John. Now I add this to this. Well, John hashes under three different hash functions to a set of numbers. Say that, for this example, pretend that they're 17, 19, and 21. I now fill in the bits. 17, 19, and 21 into this data structure. And from that point on, if you ask me, is John in there? Well, if I ask, yeah, John is in there. And the reason for that is I will just hash John again, see that it produces the bits 17, 19, and 21, and check that they're on. If something is in the data structure, if something has been memorized by this filter, I take this hash, I get the hash of it, and I check if all of the bits are on. If all of the bits are on, the thing probably was seen. There's a possibility of a false positive, but there is no possibility ever of a false negative. And this is it, I and mean, that's, that's the Bloom filter. The rest I'm gonna talk about is a bunch of algorithms that are all of this sort. The things that solve sort of simple questions that otherwise seem very difficult, like you know, how do I do this where I'm not telling you in advance how many things you have to memorize and be able to do this efficiently. So let's get started. Online, active learning, and data streams. So let's introduce these. So first, we've got online and active learning. And the way I really like to introduce these is with multi-armed bandit problem. So the multi-armed bandit problem is really, really common if you run in anything that's like a website. If you run some sort of startup, everything you deal with is like a multi-armed bandit problem, which is say, um, I've got to decide what ad I want to show to all my users today. Do I want to show them ad A or do I want to show them ad B? How do I decide this? Well, there's the obvious thing. I'm just going to run some randomized experiments. But a multi-armed bandit says, I've got two options, A and B. I want to start to learn and gradually prefer option A if A is superior and mostly show A to users coming in from that point on. 
So I want to both run an experiment and then act on that experiment. And the trick about this is that it's online. I want to be learning about whether A or B is superior. That's what I mean by online. It's that I want to be learning that in real time, and I want to have an answer at every point in time. So if I see one user, I want to know after user one, do I think A or B is better? And if I see a second user, I want to update my beliefs and have a new sense of whether A or B is superior. I don't want to be just pushing this at, off into some batch mode that sort of, you know, having run the experiment and it's over, I now can analyze it. I want to be doing my analysis in real time while the experiment is running. Active learning is something I'm not going to focus on very much in this talk, but active learning is the next step up, which is not only am I figuring out which one is better, but I'm also figuring out what things I want to be exploring in the future. That's what makes it active, which you decide what you want to learn. And if you want to do active learning, you always need to be able to do online learning. And so you need to have good tools for doing learning online. So here are the, what I would identify as the basic requirements for doing online learning. The model has to be able to survive cold starts. This means that a lot of sort of very naive frequentist things won't work. If I just start running A and B and I have no idea whether A or B are superior, I have no data, and so it's sort of not obvious what I'm going to do. One obvious trick is that you use some sort of simple prior and you just say, you know, before I know anything, I assume they both have click the rate of 0%. And then everything at that point on is going to be better by definition, and gradually you're just going to learn from there. In addition, which is, this is really the definition of online, the model has to be ready to make up-to-date predictions after every observation. And this is the thing that's going to really stand out about the stochastic gradient descent that I'm going to talk about later, which is every single time I see one observation, I want it to affect my model. I don't want to have to wait for huge batches. I want to be able to do something immediately. And in order to make that work, model updates, the steps that actually work every single observation, they need to be very cost effective. And then I mean two things by this. One, that I don't ever have to go back through all of the historical data. I want to be able to just use my current beliefs to figure out what to do next. I don't want to have to reread anything. And then two, I want to not do a lot of work on every observation. So it shouldn't be like, you know, given one new observation, I rerun all the model fitting I've ever done. That's just too costly. I want something that's kind of a quick hack. And what you're going to see is that I'm going to give you a quick hack. Um, but it's a, a sort of very well-established quick act that really was invented in the 1950s. Uh, the other context in which this comes up is data streams. And this is something that the database community is really thinking a lot about these days. And so the data streams comes up because increasingly we, we deal with data sets that are too large to fit in RAM. If you're Google, maybe everything fits in RAM. But if you're anyone else, at some point your data set doesn't fit in RAM. And you need to figure out what you're going to do with it. And the problem with this is that especially if you've grown up using R, R has just no capacity at all to deal with this. There are people building packages on top of R to deal with this, but natively, this is just not in R. And the reality is, it's not anywhere else. It's not like somehow, if you went to some other language like Python, you're going to find this. They're starting to put that into other tools, but really no one, nowhere, has provided a really clean way of doing analysis that's not in batch mode. But the problem is we have to do it. Somehow we have to be able to process memory that we process data that we can't fit in memory. Somehow we have to find some way to do these kind of analyses. And so my claim is this. You want to use algorithms that have small memory footprint, which is why I showed you that bloom filter early on. The bloom filter is nice because it's one that has an incredibly small memory proof, memory footprint. And the other thing is that I want to deal with data that streams in one observation at a time. And what I mean by stream is it comes in, I process it, and there's no guarantee I will ever get to see it again. That's what distinguishes a stream from a database, is that there's no guarantee that data will be stored. Uh, maybe I'm the NSA. I see your data, but I don't get to keep it, but I've got to do something with it. All right, so there are really obvious things. I'm actually going to use the first of these, the mean, to describe how you might do this. So there's some really simple statistics you can easily do using O of 1 memory. This means just some constant amount of memory. It doesn't depend on whether I have five observations or five trillion observations. Calculating means, variance, skewness, kurtosis, these just require a constant number of bits. Uh, John D. Cook has a really, really great blog post where he goes through code to calculate all of these things. They get progressively more subtle, but they're all pretty easy. They're all like basically an hour of coding time to make algorithms that do this in constant memory. John D. Cook. Uh, J-O-H-N, D-Cook, and it's something like uh, running stats, maybe was the, the name of the code. 
So you basically, if you look up online mean, you'll almost certainly find this post. In contrast, and this is why I showed this bloom filter, lots of other things are really difficult, although there are, are approximations that are possible without storing basically the whole data set in memory. So medians is an obvious example, but unique item count, which is not quite what bloom filter does, but something very similar, hyperloglog -log is doing this, which is just, I want to know how many different users say visited my site over the last year. Well, I can't actually store all their names except maybe in some log file that's really hard to get access to. And I definitely can't do this in some way where I'm going to store the ID of every user I've ever seen in RAM. I mean, maybe you can get away with it some places, but generally this is a bad idea. And so what you need to do is do something clever. But the problem is these things are really clever. I mean, hyperloglog -log is, is actually an incredibly elegant and beautiful 10-page paper to read but it's also a modern research paper published in the last 25 years. Uh, you know, doing these kind of things is subtle. Um, and really what it comes down to is, is there some clever graduate student or professor who wrote a probabilistic data structure to solve your problem? If there isn't, basically go home. That's, sort of, you know, that's really what it comes down to, except in the special case. And the special case is that I want to reason about complex models. And complex models, I sort of by definition, if they're complex, some graduate student isn't writing research papers about them because they're not his complex model. They're yours. And so no one else is spending their time trying to specialize how to do analysis on that complex model. And so we really the question is, how do we fit those fast and with little memory? And so the claim I'm going to have is that most people now accept that the state of the art is an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent, or SGD. And that this is, for instance, what Valpo Wabbit does, if you've ever used Valpo Wabbit, but many other tools are using this. And it's unbelievably simple intellectually. I mean, this is part of what's awesome about it is this is a tool that will just go forever on. From you, know, you leave today and you have complicated models that you want to fit at huge web scale. You can just use SGD and you're, you're sort of fine. I guess I should say sort of, because the SGD is kind of messy, but it's at least intellectually simple. Uh, so let's build up to the SGD slowly by thinking about how you compute means by using constant memory. So the really simplest way of tracking a mean is the definition we're all used to from math class, which is the mean of n data points x1 through xn is just I take the sum of them and divide by n. This is sort of the obvious way that you might think about doing this. And in code, and this is Julia code, it looks a little like this. You have the, the mean of a vector. It's first I start with 0, I figure out its length, I loop through every one of them, add them all together, and then I divide by n. Now, there's an obvious problem with this. This algorithm is not online. As stated, it gives you no useful answers until you've gone through all n data points. And that's, I mean, there's an obvious problem with it that's easy to fix, which is I'm just not doing the division along the way. I could have done that division. But as stated, this thing is just not doing something that would ever give you a real-time answer. You always have to process all the data before you're done. But there's a really obvious reformulation of this problem in terms of very simple algebraic tricks that will give you a different version. And this is the recursive definition of the mean. So the mean of n data points is n minus 1 divided by n times the mean of n minus 1 of the data points plus 1 over n times the last data points. And this definition is basically the SGD. And we're going to talk way more about why this is the SGD, but this is basically the trick. And the trick is, I have some belief at time n and the belief at time n is generated by my belief at time n minus 1 plus some trivial update based on what happened at time n. And here is exactly the trivial update to do that if you have means. So what if n is really big and 1 over n is below machine precision? You stop learning? Uh, yeah, uh, there are other tricks you we need to really think a little bit about what you're going to do. But I mean, it's sort of unbelievable. I mean, I guess there exist cases in which you could get an n so that this is not going to work. But the mean, the n in which, if, you, if n is a float 64, the n in which this starts, stops working is like way bigger than the number of people on Earth. And way bigger than the number of transactions. So it doesn't anyway. completely stop, but it kind of like goes away from what you think it should be because of the same machine precision. Right? Before it completely fails, it actually starts lying. But it's compared so so to the original formula. It, I mean, it definitely, it definitely does do that at some point. But I mean, I think if, if you're having that problem, machine precision is sort of cheap to juggle. Like if you're dealing with things where all you needed was to go up to 128 bit floats, find somebody who's going to make 128 bit float chip for you, and you're going to, you know, and that, that sort of that's going to solve most of your problems. You know, like 
By the time you get to 256 bits, I would be very surprised that you had any problem anywhere. There, there aren't enough atoms in the universe for you to be finding problems beyond 256 bit floats. <laughs> like, there, are, there aren't enough atoms for you to be actually using 64 bits of floats, but you know, there certainly are not enough atoms for you to go past 256. Uh, I think there's not even, well, I guess there are enough atoms to use 64 bit ints, but uh, certainly not floats. <laughs> Um, uh, how do you start that? What, what's your first? Um, so the map, yeah. So I, it d really depends on the exact application you want. I'm going to pretend for the rest of my talk that I always start things at zero. So, but it does really depends. Like um, in the Bandit case, if you do this kind of rule for updating, it's really important for many app practical applications that you start it with a very optimistic guess of what the mean is. And this, um, yeah, we'll talk later if you want to know why that's true, but sort of, it, it really depends on your application, how you want to start this thing. Uh, yeah? There's other versions of the online mean code. What did you say? There's many versions of the online mean code. Yeah. This is just, say, I've seen another one that's not really this. Yeah, so there are actually others that are slightly more robust numerically, I think, than this one. Um, so why do you choose this one? This one is really simple and is going to be also how you get to the SGD. Like it's, it's gonna obviously generalize to that. Um, and so you know, just to show you sort of obvious code to do this, and this is just, you know, this is just that equation written in code, this is something you could do. And, and the nice thing is that if you're using this kind of code at every point in time, at every iteration, M is actually a usable mean you could be doing something with. And so this really simple update rule is actually usable. It will both give you the right idea and be usable online. But the thing I really like about this and why I use this specific form is that we can think of this in a sort of much more general context, which is this sort of convex combination rule. I've got my beliefs at time n. I've got some constant alpha, which is how much I weight what's coming into me, which is xn. And then I'm also just one minus alpha is how much I keep of my previous beliefs. And this, you know, in this context, when we're doing the exact correct frequentist mean, alpha of n is going down like one over n. But, and I'm gonna claim, the important thing is thinking about generalizations from there. And so, let's think about the obvious generalization. And the obvious generalization, which is actually not in some sense more general, but somehow just different, is to drop off the dependency on n, and just have some constant value of alpha. So now alpha just is some constant period that I've established. And if you know this formula, play around with it if you're not familiar with it. This is the exponentially weighted average version of averages. It's going to progressively increase the importance of recent events. And so you're always sort of going to slowly forget things that happened in the past. And this formula is exactly the SGD. This is exactly a way of solving the SGD for this very simple case. And so let's look at it to see that. Well, let's first look at its behavior. So here's a graph where I have a moving target. I'm trying to track the mean of the blue thing, which is this random walk. And the problem with trying to track the mean of this blue thing is that it doesn't have an actual fixed mean, it's constantly moving. And so using the frequentist version, which is the red line here, it will actually be able to track things if things move slow enough, but it goes really slow and doesn't do a great job. In contrast, my other thing, where I fixed alpha to be some constant, I'm actually much better able to track fluctuations in this. It, now how well I do depends a lot on alpha. I picked alpha here so it sort of does a good job of mimicking it, but if I do a bad job of picking alpha, I will just smooth everything, or I'll only remember the most recent observation. I won't have anything useful. And actually, unfortunately, that, that statement is actually just gonna be endemic through the entire rest of this discussion about how to use the SPD, which is picking the step size alpha is basically always a problem you have to deal with. There are starting to be better solutions to it, but it's not a solved problem yet. Um, but my, my claim is that in many contexts, what you actually might want is this slight generalization, the version where you have alpha be some arbitrary constants. And here's one reason you might think that's a cool idea. Let's just rewrite the equation I wrote. So the equation I wrote was that m of n is one minus alpha times n minus, time m of n minus one plus alpha of xn. And just shifting things around, this is exactly the same thing as saying that m of n is like m at n minus one plus alpha times the difference between what I saw and what my previous beliefs would have seen. And this is what people in the reinforcement literature 
reinforcement learning literature call a prediction error. And the SGG is exactly this. And we're going to prove that this is actually the gradient of this function in just a second. But the idea basically is every time I'm trying to make good predictions, that's what my beliefs are for. At every point in time, I'm going to see whether I'm doing a good job. And then I'm going to head in the direction that would make me do a better job. I'm always just going to try to do slightly better. I'm going to move in the gradient that leads me to making better decisions. And that's exactly what this formula looks like. And the SPD is just going to be this principle used in other contexts. And so here's the reason. Imagine that I have a loss function. And my loss function is, given some constant n and some data sets, I figure out how much I've mispredicted things along the way. And that's just like taking the sum and I'm, for here, I've intentionally scaled it by one half because it just makes the calculus easier. But I'm taking the sum of xi's minus m and squaring them. And this is uh, presumably very familiar to everyone as a classical statistics education. This is just the standard sum of squared errors thing that you see over and over and over again. But the relevant thing is if I have that loss function, then the gradient is just a negative version of xi minus m, this prediction error. My failure in my prediction is the scale as the negated version of the gradient. And if I'm going to do gradient descent, what I want to do is go in the negative version of it. And so it's literally just going to be xi minus m. So the gradient over the entire data I would ever have seen is just all of the xi's minus m's summed up for, for any m that I choose. And the trick that I'm going to do, and I'm just going to reiterate this over and over again through this talk, the trick is just going to be doing that but only looking at one of them. Instead of looking at the sum of all the differences, I'm just going to look at a single one, xi minus m, at every point in time and use that as an approximation of the gradient and then move in that direction. And if, if that makes sense to you already, it's sort of you're done. Like sort of, there's nothing left in this talk if that's totally clear to you, but presumably sort of a little more information would be useful to you. And this is just rewriting this. So this is saying that formula I wrote, which is looking at the updates at time n, is like my previous beliefs and then some scaled version of my prediction error. That's really like saying that my updates are my previous beliefs plus something that takes me in the negative gradient, something that takes me a little bit in that direction. And so this is, this is stochastic gradient descent. So the thing that makes it stochastic in this case is just looking at the single contribution from xi, not looking at all of the data all at once, but only looking at a single data point in each time. And this is the SQD for tracking means. And in fact, it's exactly the same as if I had just done gradient descent. So if you've learned how to do gradient descent to try to fit models, this is exactly that algorithm. There's, there is no difference between them. This is just a hack that lets you do it so that you, every single observation you have an updated version of your model. There's, there's nothing else that's distinct about this. And that's because simple calculus tells us the gradient over all of the observations is the sum of the observations per observation gradients. And that's, that's all that matters, is this, this sort of nice linearity of how the calculus works. Now, the full SQD algorithm introduces a little bit of randomness, which is if you had a fixed data set, I would randomly draw xi at any given point. I would just go into a bucket of values xi, I just pull out a random one and then use that to do this updating rule. And that is, that is it. I mean, that is literally the entire SGD algorithm for this case. And you'll see that this is it for every other case. So let's talk about SGD. So the way I want to do it is to build up gradually to doing stochastic gradient descent for linear regression. And so maybe, no one, maybe you're not familiar with it, but I claim that this is what linear regression is. Linear regression is this equation. And if you ever have a chance to read a book on optimization theory, this is the way optimization people will just frame it. Um, many statisticians would, but this is definitely the way optimization people, which is I have a loss function given some parameters beta. And beta is my mapping that goes from x, my inputs, to my predictions y. And what I try to do is to take y minus x transpose beta and fit and find the minimum version of that in the squared norm. And this is exactly what we did before. And this is just writing in a simple notation. And if I have it this way, well, then its gradient is just, well, its version, which is a summation. And this is really what matters. And so far, I sort of have left this implicit. But let me make this very clear. The trick about using SGD, if you're going to try to use it in practice for something you care about, is that you need to use it on models where 
the loss function over all of your data is the sum of the exact same function applied at every data point. If every data point is treated the same way and you're just summing up errors per data point to get your entire loss function, then everything I say will just carry through and there's no need for modifications. If that's not true, you're just in a much, much more complicated situation and I mean, we can talk later, but things are gonna be bad in general if you're just sort of not having this property. Thankfully, almost every statistical model you care about is this. I was gonna say, can you give some examples where you'd be in a bad place? Uh, so, the, I mean, so any model in which you think the data is not all independent, so if you think like the observations are not all independent draws, then that's a bad place. Um, and Markov models would be an example of something like that. So that, that's, a, that's a case where sort of you don't think every single one of them is the same, and so you can't just sort of in, pull one of them by itself and then add them all up. Um, I got a bunch of questions. Yeah, you got a question then, Georgette? No, so any, mo any model that you have, so any model which you think is probabilistically generating data and every data, every data point is IID, then the log likelihood will be a summation of the likelihoods at every term and all of them will have the same likelihood. Yeah, so that, I mean, I'm totally glossing over the fact that if you try to deal with non-convex problems, you also have problems. But if you deal with non-convex problems in, in general, there are bad things coming for you. It's typical of some, but not necessarily, I mean, I mean, well, here's an obvious example of a non-linear thing that it's not typical of, it's not typical of logistic regression. Logistic regression is totally convex and, and profoundly non-linear. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you think that you are dealing with a problem that is not on this list and you're not sure whether this works, uh, I, guess I, have two, I, mean, I guess I have two answers. One is you should maybe think a little bit about what you're doing, and another one is often it doesn't matter whether you actually got the real optimum, like, um, like all the neural net people. The neural net people are like not actually trying to find global optima. If, you know, if they get there, it's awesome, but often they just care that their model at a local optimum is doing better than other people's global optima. Right, but um, Yeah, it is definitely important to say that. Um, yeah, all right. So the important thing here is that for this linear regression case, I'm just looking at the sum of squared errors. And so every one of them looks like this. My prediction, which I just get is some linear prediction, and I just look at the residual, and then that is basically going to be my gradient. And let's just see that you know, exactly the gradient is just going to be the residual, yi minus x, x trans, xi transpose beta times xi, this is the gradient. And then you know, just go home and convince yourself of this, because this is not familiar to you. It's like a, a sort of very valuable exercise to do this at some point for yourself. But this is what every one of the terms error contribution is, which is just, and it really should be, I think, very intuitive. It's just saying, how much do I need to change my beliefs? Well, I need to change my beliefs in response to two things. How big an error I made, which is the residual yi minus xi beta. And then another thing, how big each of the xi components was. So if one of the terms in my regression model was really big and I made a big error, then I should really change that one's coefficient. If in contrast it was really small and I made a big error, it probably isn't responsible as much as the other ones that are big. So you know, focus the energy on things that are mostly causing the problems, and then mostly change your beliefs when things have big problems. So that's the way you can intuitively remember this gradient. And so gradient descent would be that at every iteration, you're just going to update beta at time t to be its previous version of t minus 1. And let's just assume, as I said earlier, that beta at 0 is just all zeros, just a vector of zeros everywhere. And that at every point in time, I just move along the negative gradients a distance eta. And if you know good gradient descent code, and I'm actually sort of gonna go fast, thanks. I'm gonna go pretty fast, so I'm actually not gonna go through the code for this and just sort of stick to the math. Um, well, how many people know what a line search is? Like, and how many people are like, yeah, I've coded a line search algorithm? Yeah, so not many people have done this. So 
This is gradient descent. If you use eta to be the same value all the time at every iteration, it will eventually get where it's going to go most of the time. Uh, sometimes you'll have problems with floating points and other things, but it's just really slow and inefficient. A, a better way to do this in professional gradient descent software, which you know, sort of there isn't that much of it because it's not a great algorithm, but if, if you were using professional software to do this, it would choose eta at every iteration in a custom way that would be more appropriate. And that's what a, a line search algorithm is going to figure out what eta is. Uh, and that really does matter. We're going to deal with the fact that we are not really smart enough to figure out how to do that. And for SGD, it generally is the case that people have not yet figured out how to set these in an intelligent way and just use them as constants and let computers hopefully make up for it by running longer. So sort of, we, we're not great at it, but computers can do a lot. So let's just let computers do it. So this is gradient descent. And stochastic gradient descent in this model is, well, here's the code. I'm going to skip this. I'll just focus on the SGD code, which will be almost identical, but sort of more relevant. John, sorry. Can you go back to the slide where you put the ADA in there? Uh, yeah. Does the ADA have any interpretation, like, like an inverse temperature or anything like that? Or is it just a mysterious parameter that makes it work? There may be literature in which it has that interpretation, but I have never read it. Uh, but that does not preclude its existence, just that I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. it. I mean, it's, yeah. We can talk later about sort of what you should be doing at every iteration and what the logic of what eta is supposed to be, but it's sort of, it's, it's just the distance you should go to minimize the function of that iteration. That's what it is. I have a question. What key on logic do you require in beta t and beta t minus 1 to invert it? Yeah, so. You, Very important. So the, the, claim, the claim is the following. If the function you're trying to minimize is convex, then running this from any starting point will eventually converge to the true optimum. <coughs> That's, that, is, that is the relevant theoretical claim. So this will eventually get to the true. Converge by what? I, what do I mean by converge? I mean that as, as t goes to infinity, the value squared norm will go to zero. I mean, the distance between t and t minus 1 is 1, and the distance between, nor the distance between betas is going to be the Euclidean norm. That's, and that's, I mean, if you want, I'll, I'm happy to give you references about the exact definition of convergence, but the convergence is going to be this thing is exactly the same as the true value, and it's going to uh, get there at the true optimum eventually as t goes to infinity. That's, that's the theoretical claim. Not there's nothing probabilistic I've, so far. I have nothing I've said is probabilistic, so that's sort of a red herring. Um, yeah, this is streaming data, it's time data, and time data often has auto correlation, so it seems like a very limited type of situation to be able to apply this if you could apply it to auto correlation. Well, this certainly applies in auto correlation. Oh, I mean, I did say that, but that's also not, I mean, if I. I sort of want to not get waylaid on this because I think it's a sort of technical issue, but sort of all reasonable models that if I, any model model that I personally respect, that this will work. And if you're using a model that this won't work, I think you shouldn't be using that model. Uh, I, mean, I think that's, and it sort of doesn't depend on autocorrelations because this is just a property of convexity of functions. Okay, so there is autocorrelation. It'll, yeah, so it'll still, it'll still work on this sort of, it, it really like only if your function has like, weird problems that sort of it's got, for instance, it's not identifiable. If your model is not identifiable, this won't work, but I think people who use non identifiable models sort of should rethink of their models. Um, all right, let's, let's sort of not get too slowed down. I, I guess I should have allocated more time to spend on classical gradient descent. I think it's more interesting, and it's so similar to go through the theory of SGD, so let's just focus on that, and it'll be basically the same thing. So we'll skip the GD code. So the SGD trick is this, and this partly solves your concern about autocorrelation, which is at every point in time, I'm going to draw one of the observations randomly. And this is the theory where this is definitely going to work, is that I just draw something randomly from a bucket. If they're coming in streaming on a website, that's not necessarily true. Basically, that's just hope. You hope that that works, but sort of no guarantees that it's going to be true. But in a theoretical case, and I'm going to implement code that does exactly this, I'm going to assume that I have a bucket of data that it's too big to fit in memory, so I can't process all of it. But at any given point in time, I can pull in and reach one row out of my database. 
And this is actually, I mean, in the case in which I have used these techniques, which is dealing with things like the Twitter fire hose, it is not in fact the case that I can never go back and get the fire hose. I have all of it. It's just the case that I can't store all of it in RAM at one point. And so I just pull a chunk of it in, work on that chunk, put it back down, and then pull another random chunk. And the randomness is what solves the concern you have. But even then, I mean, as long as you use a fixed data set, eventually these things should work. Uh, there, there, are, there are definitely problems, and they are brittle, but they will sort of, from a theoretical perspective, they'll work. So let's actually, like, uh, let's show that. So the SVD is going to be, instead of looking at the gradient over all the things, it's just going to use just the gradient at a single term. So here is how you, this is the SVD equation to do linear regression. If you want to fit a linear regression on any data set that you're going to stream, just use this update rule. So at every point in time, you update your current betas, and what do you do? You move a distance eta towards y minus xi transpose beta xi. You just go in the direction of your error, and then just try to minimize that error one by one, observation by observation. And let's go through code to make it very clear how that works. So here's code, and this is going to mutate a vector. So I have data. X is my matrix of data. Y is my vector of responses. B is my vector of parameters. Eta is this constant. And then GR is my store of what I'm going to put the gradient in. I actually don't need to store the gradient, but I'm just going to use it. Um, and here's what I do, and this is Julia code, so it sort of looks very matlab -y. So the first thing I do is figure out how many parameters P there are and how many observations I have N. So that's P and the size of X. So this is just saying that all of the columns are observations, and then each column has P rows because it has P, dimension, P different features that I'm trying to use. Uh, did I? Yes. Yeah, is that transposed? Yes, yeah, so this is the transpose of what you would do if you were using R, say. This is, this is just more efficient in Julia because it has the way it stores data, but this is the transpose of how one often thinks of data. Um, and then given that I know how many observations there are, I just generate a random number between 1 and n. That's j. That's the observation I'm going to look at. That's the thing I'm going to pull out of the bucket. And then from then on, I'm just going to work on just that observation. And so h is my prediction. So I take the dot product of the features for the jth observation and b, my current parameters. And then I calculate the residual y of j minus h. The gradient is just that residual times all the features for the j observation. And then I update beta by doing, by, pl you know, by plus equaling it. So taking beta is beta plus eta times the gradients. This is exactly the equation we just saw before, just written in code. And this is going to just mutate this thing, which is why I have this exclamation mark. As you can see, IPython notebook is not fond of exclamation marks or of Greek letters, mm -hmm. but I am, so they're there. Um, and then the outer loop that does this is going to look just like this. I'm going to have my data x, y, eta, which I fixed. And here I'm just giving you some example value you could have set it to, some small number like 0, 0, 001. But no claim is made that this is the value that's going to work for you. Uh, and the number of iterations I want to make. And for here, let's say just 1,000. And then here what I do is I look at the size of the data. I pre-allocate my initial estimates of the coefficients, which are just all zeros. I pre-allocate the grad gradient, which is just all zeros. I figure that I'm currently at iteration zero. And then I just make this while loop, where every iteration, I count that I've done one more iteration, and then do the thing we just saw. And this is it. I mean, this is stochastic gradient descent for linear regression. You know, those two functions, if you can figure out how to make them scale for your data set and whatever you need to do, that's it. There's, sort of, there's no more magic left to fitting linear regression. So, so in the case where this is streaming data, the max integer wouldn't be bounded? Exactly. So in the case where this is streaming data, you're going to have this thing just constantly running all the time and say just while true is going to be this loop. Uh, and then presumably in that case, you want to have something that also has access to B so that's something you can do something with beta at every point in time. Um, so you, and so people who sort of have done this at large scale and gone this work in production systems, they've thought a lot about sort of what is the mechanism that's communicating beta to the rest of the world to make predictions. And I think there was another hand. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, it looks like we're not worrying about pulling the same value again if the data is so large, or? So it's actually a good thing that we sometimes pull the same value. Um, so it's, it's, so the thing that makes this thing so nice and actually solves the autocorrelation problem is that this thing is what it's actually doing is at every point in time, 
its expected update is the expected value of the gradient. That's actually the trick that makes this thing, whole thing work, is that the expected value of the gradient is actually the true gradient over the whole data set. And so the fact that I'm allowed to, that I'm sampling with replacements, that's actually really important because that's what guarantees that the expected value of these updates is the true gradient. And that's what guarantees that this thing is actually doing the same thing as gradient descent, just sort of in a different, more randomized way. Does that answer your question? All right. Um, but that, so that's a, that is a sort of fairly subtle point. Like that, that randomness does actually matter. Um, and the one way you could think about it is, and I think there's probably papers, but I have yet to read them, that sort of are doing things that make it clear the relationship between the STD and the bootstrap. But there is sort of a sort of similar spirit between calculating the STD and like bootstrap and gradient descent. There's something very similar in sort of the way you think about them. Yeah. This is kind of uh, orthogonal to this method, but a lot of times, you know, you want to scale your features, and in order to scale your features, uh, you might need to know um, some properties about them. Is there sort of this parallel, crazy, like, feature scaling, streaming? Yeah, so I'm not going to get to that. So, so let's actually quickly talk about, right now, let's talk about why, when this would go badly, and the first obvious case is the one you just brought up. So um, the first problem is that you have to actually know the right value of eta. This, this constant that deciding how far you go at every iteration along the gradient, it really matters. It matters exactly as much as that original graph I showed you where I had really carefully hand-tuned alpha. And if I had set alpha to be something else, I would have sort of always gotten the same constant. And if I had gotten alpha to something totally different, I would have sort of flopped randomly around space and never learned anything. It really, really matters that you set eta to the right values here. Um, and so most people who try to do this will have some sort of tricks. To sort of either you say start with a sort of very small subset of the data, read that, explore a bunch of different values of eta, find the best value of eta, and then use that for the rest of the data. Or you might do something like early stopping where you're fitting most of the stream, but then you have some held out cross validation set where you're constantly checking. And when you sort of see that you're doing badly, you stop trying to move in the gradient anyway. There's all sorts of tricks to setting eta. But even when you set eta to the best possible value, the fact that the features may not all have the same scale is a total killer. The thing that makes this bad is the thing that in general makes gradient descent bad. So if you've sort of sat down at some point in your life, and if you haven't, I totally encourage doing this. If you sat down and coded gradient descent, there are two obvious things that go very badly for gradient descent. One is that some of the features are really huge and some of the others are really small. And so the gradient is just sort of totally lopsided towards some of them and not towards the others. And which makes sort of the ideal setting of eta different for one of them from the others. And that's sort of a huge problem. And I'm gonna talk about one standard solution which is what people call adagrad, which is which we actually set a different eta for every feature. And that's gonna fix the fact that they all have different scales because you're gonna set eta relative to the scale of every feature. And you're gonna do that online. That's out of grand. Um, and that's the first of the big problems, which is the fact that these things all have weird different scaling that really screws up these systems. The other much deeper thing, and I, I feel like the solutions to this other deeper thing are not great yet, which is that if some of the features are very, very highly correlated, this thing starts to get progressively worse and worse and worse. And that's actually also true of gradient descent, which is that if you have really correlated features, gradient descent is kind of a bad algorithm to use. And it's also really true here in SGD. And I, so I don't think, because we're sort of running a little low on time, but I can maybe if I can pull it off, I'll do some live coding and some demos of this stuff. I mean, in cases in which those two properties are not true, in which all the features more or less have the same scale and things are not highly correlated, SGD basically does exactly as well as other model fitting techniques, which is pretty great because it runs streaming. When those things are true, when things are really correlated or have really different scales, SGD can be pretty bad. Um, the problem basically is a sort of it's what we've got for dealing with streaming data, but it's still like not a great solution. All right, so now that I've given you all the caveats, let's, let's look through the rest of what I've got. So, so let's just, I'll actually skip the matrix factorization one because it's a little more complicated. Let's just look at, this is the only change required to that code to make something that solves logistic regression instead of linear regression. So first I just need to write out this function here that is the inverse logit. And then 
all I do that's different is just update the residuals in a different way. This is the only difference, because this is the, the only difference that matters between these models is that they have slightly different gradients, and this is the difference in their gradients. This is exactly what differs between these two models. And so if you were trying to fit classification model streaming, this is how you fit streaming logistic regression. And so I think this is sort of really why I like SVD, is that as long as you feel like you know enough calculus to do gradients, you know enough to fit arbitrary models in the streaming context. I think that's the thing that makes this a really powerful technique. Um, these slides will be online, but here's an example where I pulled code and just, I, well, I wrote code that emulates the math in one of the classic papers on the Netflix prize. So this is solving the matrix factorization streaming. And if you looked at the Netflix data, you realize that Netflix data is one of the things you also probably can't fit in RAM on your laptop. But thankfully, this is the sort of easy way to solve those kind of problems. And it, the trick basically is that it's just linear regression, but oscillates between two different factors. Um, let's talk a little about what goes wrong. So this already came up. So the fact that you have to choose this constant step size eta, that's bad. The fact that you have to tune this, I mean, anything that's tunable is always just bad. Things that are tunable are likely to go wrong. Um, Good batch algorithms, as I said, use these line search algorithms, which will set ADA for you. We don't really have a great theory of how to do that when you're in the online setting. We're starting to have it. Um, Brian D'Alessandro, when he heard I was doing this talk, wrote to me and said, we've been using recently um, one of the things that John Langford has published a paper on that works really well. So people are starting to come up with algorithms for setting ADA, but it's something that's definitely a, an active topic of research. Um, Another problem, sort of high quality convergence. So really getting exactly the right thing up to a bunch of significant digits, those are really slow compared to things you might use in a batch setting. So the, the classic example in a batch setting would be quasi-Newton methods, and they need sort of the knowledge of the Hessian, which is what solves these correlation between features. SGD is just not gonna give you that. It's just gonna give you an approximate solution, but it's not gonna sort of get the refined details in general. Um, and the other thing that's really annoying is that if you're not careful, a lot of the time when you code up SPD, it's just going to completely break. And not like kind of break, but just like be totally useless. And this is because if you're not careful, that initial step that you make on the very first iteration from ADA is going to take you really, really far because the gradient is really big. And then the problem is that the next step, the gradient to fix that mistake is going to be even bigger and just going to blow up. And so, you know, if you're even slightly off at the setting of eta, it's very easy that you just wind up with inf as the value of all of your coefficients. Mm -hmm. um, and this happens way more often than I'd care to admit, mm -hmm. which is why tuning eta, which is the first line, really matters. That this will definitely happen in production. Um, yeah, so it is saying definitely to try to use that. Um, and I'm actually going to talk about what is sort of the analog to momentum. So momentum is the concept from gradient descent, where basically you average gradients over time, and there are varieties of momentum, but they all sort of have that spirit of being averages of gradients. The analog is what's sometimes called polyac averaging, and that's going to be basically the same thing, and I have some slides to show how that works. Um, yeah, so let's, let's get to that, but you know, that is one solution you might try to put into these things. So I guess there's two points, and, and Leon Batu, who's written a lot of really nice papers about this topic, really iterates these points over and over again, so I think I should iterate them. Sometimes low precision conversions is actually a virtue. Sometimes low precision actually kind of winds up being like running regularization, even without having apps for it. Uh, and the claim, and I think this actually is a true claim, is that often bad optimization algorithms are good <laughs> learning algorithms that trying to find the exact best fit to your data is not always a good thing if your data is kind of bad, and that sometimes a kind of hacky fit to that data may actually be more beneficial. Um, and so I think that's another virtue, is that often these things actually give good fits. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some tricks that exist for improving SGD. So one is, you really should do this, is decrease step sizes over time, so I'll talk a little bit about how to do that. Another is smoothing estimates by averaging, which is basically momentum. And another is setting learning rates per parameter, which is how to deal with the fact that the features have different scales, and that's out of grad. Um, and there's, you know, there's a literature on all of these tricks. So the first one is actually very classical. So let's go back to thinking about inferring the mean, and sort of what is the optimal thing? That if the thing is stationary, and you're just trying to find the right mean, what is the way you should have been setting alpha? Well, 
if you were doing stationary data set, the right way to say alpha is that at every point in time n, alpha of n should have been 1 over n. You should just gradually be decreasing this step size. And that's actually a very general principle. There was a, a proof by Robinson and Rowe, and I think probably an earlier, well, actually, no, Robinson and Rowe was a different paper. Uh, the same Robbins, I believe, in the 50s published a proof of this same. And Robinson and Rowe was something slightly different, um, which is that, in general, if you want to guarantee convergence for the SGD, you need to guarantee that alpha decreases like 1 over n. Um, and there are slightly more. It needs to actually, like, it needs to decrease like 1 over n, but not as fast as 1 over n squared. So it has to be somewhere below 1 over n squared, but has to be at least as fast as 1 over n. And that's the, the theoretical claim required to get actual convergence to the true values. Um, but if your data is not stationary, convergence is sort of much less important. And n is your total number of data points? Yeah, n is all the data points you see. So how do you deal with it? Well, n never is infinity because you've never seen an infinite amount of data. But that's what I'm saying. It's not total. It's a total you've seen so far. So yeah, I guess we, we mean different things by the word total, but yeah, it's the, it's the total you've seen up, at up to time n. All right, and then, you know, so if you read the literature, you'll start to see equations that look like this, which is that alpha of n is that constant eta, but decreasing like 1 over n with maybe some offsets, tau zero, which is sort of like the effective initial value of n. Um, and that gives you just two parameters instead of one to two, which is annoying. But this is often will give you much, much better results. And I, I believe, and maybe someone will correct me if I'm wrong, this is the default setting in scikit-learn for doing SVD is just to use this setting for alpha. Another one is the question about momentum. And this is averaging estimates. So I think it's actually easier to just show it. Um, so this is exactly the same rule we did for linear regression. But here's this polyac rubber averaging. So let me just sort of show what really matters. The trick is that instead of just containing beta as a solution, beta is actually going to be this like kind of hacky intermediate solution. And our real solution is going to be C. And then every iteration, we do the normal SGD pass, which I'm here calling polyac pass. But it's exactly what you saw before to update beta. But at every point in time, then what I do is I set C, my real solution. C is an average of my previous version of C, and then the current update I have to B. And this is like momentum. Sort of, it's not exactly the same, but it's a sort of similar spirit. And if you sit down and write out the expansions, you'll see that it's basically averaging out, out, averaging out gradients over time. And this thing turns out, in my experience, to be ridiculously better than sort of black box SGD. Um, Sort of considering how cheap it is as a solution, it's sort of so little work to do it. It turns out, in my experience, to sort of solve a lot of the really awful instabilities that you can sometimes get in these things. Um, so that's one way you might try to solve the other, some of these problems. And the last thing I'm going to mention before I stop is a per parameter step size. And this is Adagrad. Yep. So actually, all of the things that matter about Adagrad are right here. So. Like before, we're going to randomly draw J, which observation we're going to analyze. We've got our, you know, our hypothesis H, our prediction. We've got our residual, the difference between the truth and our hypothesis. But here's what's going to happen. We're going to update the gradients, like we were doing every time before. And then what we have is this additional thing that we store S. And S is just the sum of the squared entries and the gradients we've seen so far. And so that's what S of I plus, plus equals GR of I. So at every point in time, so at time n, s for feature 1 is the sum of the squared entry and the gradient for feature 1 at every other point from, uh, from 1 up to n minus 1. And so this is just giving you some sense of the scale of the gradient. And the scale of the gradient is related to the scale of that feature. And so this is just giving you some sense of the scale of that feature. And then what you do then is you set beta to be like eta times the gradient but shrunken down by the size of the sums of the previous gradients. And that, sum has two, and that sum has two nice properties. One is it deals with a per parameter feature problem, which is some of the features are big and some of them are small. That solves that problem. And also, this, because this sum gradually increases as n increases, is actually like a hackish way of also decreasing like 1 over n. This also, which is not obvious, but it also has the property that this thing gradually goes towards zero. And so this, this Adagrad trick, and this was very, very highly recommended to me by Alex Passos, um, and so I sort of very, very strongly prefer it. 
this thing I find is sort of this um, mixed with some polyag averaging goes a, goes a really long way to making this usable in practice. I, I think you're, there's a type where you're returning B, right? No, so these are all mutating functions. That's what that uh, exclamation okay, is. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm editing B in place and then just returning void. This is very, like, this is very C style Julia code. Um, and so that's actually, I believe, um, well, yeah, so I guess I'll let people ask questions first, and then I'll sort of say my last three things, and then have broader questions. Is there a good recommended way to calculate standard errors? Uh, for the estimates of these things? Yeah, where statisticians find standard errors? Well, uh, the SVG is generally used in cases in which what we really want is predictions, not true estimates of parameters. Um, there probably is literature on that, but I'm not familiar with it. Um, in large part because basically every paper I've ever written on the thread, not well, I've never written any papers on this, every paper I've ever read on this topic has been written by a machine learning person, and machine learning people just don't care about standard errors. Uh, and so I, I think sort of since that, I, I think they may exist papers that have talked about how to do that, but I've, I've never read any of them. Uh, if someone knows one, I would love to hear about it, but I, I'm not aware that they even exist, let alone that they sort of are usable. <laughs> yeah, this is, the SCD very much comes from machine learning culture. It very much comes from people who are just trying to make predictions at sort of massive scales, and they're sometimes sort of throwing some topics under the bus. Uh, Adam? Well, all my examples are like that, but you could just be processing it where every iteration you're just processing one and it's not randomly selected. You're just pretending like it was randomly selected. You just use the newest thing, and that, and that actually, in that context, which is the virtue of setting alpha to be a constant, in that context where you're just accepting the newest data, this model, because you're having alpha to be a constant, will be like an exponentially weighted average of those values you should have had for the parameters. And so when, say, summer comes and people suddenly have different behavior than they had in winter, the model will shift to be a new type of model. And so that's how we sort of will deal with the fact that the data is not actually random, is that the, the constant alpha will actually fix that problem somewhat. I mean, it creates other problems, but it fixes that one. Is the um, alpha the AF or is it? Yeah, they're basically the same thing. Alpha was what I used in the original equations, and then eta is what I was using in these equations. And then you had a question? Yeah, this, uh, this has your free optimization, does that have something to do with uh, determining the data here? Uh, there probably are, so the question was, does Hessian free optimization have something to do with this? I didn't, have not yet read a paper on using Hessian free methods for stochastic gradient descent, but there probably will be one soon, since it sort of sounds obviously like the title of a NIPS paper. Um, so Hessian free methods are just a sort of a, a trick for not having to store the whole Hessian, and so they're pretty great tools. Um, but I don't actually, I've never used one, so I've never coded it, so I don't know the details. But my sense is that they're pretty involved iterative calculations, and so they're kind of hard to do in this streaming context. There's probably someone who's going to figure it out, but it's sort of not obvious to me how to get them to work. Um, but probably at some point they will exist and be usable. Um, and that's actually very closely related to this thing, which is variants of quasi-Newton methods. So the, there have been people creating things that sort of approximate not just the gradient online, but the Hessian online. Um, I've never gotten those, I've never coded them up at all, so I had no idea that they wouldn't work, but I've never sort of read through a paper and like, oh yeah, I can easily implement this in five minutes and, re and sort of written the code to do it. Uh, my sense is that they probably are much better than what I presented, but they're probably also a lot harder. Uh, but anything that's going to be able to sort of tell you about correlations between parameters, which the Hessian is going to give you some of that information, in general is going to probably give you better behavior. Um, but I also, sort of, I once brought this up in a conversation with yesterday with Rob Shapiri about why you might want that. And I think he made an interesting point, which is very sort of ML response, which is, well, you really need the Hessian if you want to get exactly the right coefficients. But his response was, well, I don't really ever care about the exact right coefficients of the, correlate, if the features of that correlated, because sort of many different settings of the coefficients would have been just as good. And so one reason why maybe you don't need the Hessian is that maybe for the purpose of prediction it's sort of irrelevant. Um, I mentioned this idea of automatic learning rate tuning. 
So this is some papers that John Langford has, which is saying sort of how, how, how do you actually set ADA in some automatic way? I think that stuff probably in the next five to 10 years will be sort of largely solved, and this will be just technology that's sort of black boxable. Right now, you do actually need to think a lot about this before you run this in production, but I think people will start to solve this problem. Uh, and then the final one, which is to make this thing really run nice, often to get a great solution, you actually don't want to totally stream the data, but you want to make a more than one pass through all of it. So you want to take some big thing, stream it row by row, but you actually need to make more than one pass to get through it. Um, and figuring out how many passes you need to make is also another question. And I think that's sort of the other big problem that comes up on this. And there are a bunch of papers uh, that are all basically, I mean, the, the holy grail of this literature, to be very clear, the holy grail of this is to eventually figure out completely automatic techniques that you don't have to make more than one pass to your data to get the right model fits. Um, people are getting there, but they're sort of not yet there. And it really depends on what data you have, whether you could get away with less than one whole pass to the data. Well, so I guess there's two contexts. Um, so one is you could you could write out you can write out a subgradient for lasso, and there is a paper showing how to solve the lasso streaming. So sort of if you like lasso, you can still get lasso to work in this context. Uh, the other question is storing this buffer, which I assume you mean by like subsampling your data and taking a subset. So that actually is very related to this. You can actually instead of looking at a single observation, look at many of them at once, and that's called a mini batch. And a lot of this literature talks about how to do analysis of many batches. Um, the real question that I think is relevant is, is your goal to go through your historical data and then sub randomly subsample historical data and find a good model? And that's often a, like, a totally reasonable goal. But if that's your goal, just do that. The context in which I think this is more relevant is, is not necessarily that frequent a context that actually occurs. But when it does is, I actually want to be really genuinely incrementing this model every time that I have, say, new customers arrive. And I want to be able to make predictions quickly for that one new customer who arrives. And that's the case where I don't really want to substantial old data. I want to be able to make updates for them quickly. Um, and I think that that context is one that we sort of have not yet really reached because it's very hard to make these things fast enough to actually do that. But that's sort of that's the idealized vision of the context where you're not going to randomly subsample data, but instead you're going to try to do it in the streaming fashion. Um, but which one? I mean, which one works? It, it really sort of depends on the details of what you can pull off. Like if you if you can pull off things like this, they often are much better for say trying to run a multi-arm band of tests than than doing random subsampling. But it, it really, really, really depends on the specific details of your application. Did that? seem like a reasonable, but probably not great answer. OK, cool. Um, so I'm actually going to stop because I sort of wanted to get through this material fairly quickly. And I feel like it's probably really late, and it is. Um, so if there are any closing questions, or otherwise, sort of you can talk to me at the bar. Uh, I see no closing questions. So what's up? Right. So we're gonna have, so yeah, so we're heading up to Rye House. That will be the bar that if you want to come ask me a question or just hang out and drink for a little bit, we'll be there. I think it's at 17th Street, right? Yeah, the two west of fifth. Yeah, so 17th between West and Fifth, and we'll be there in a few minutes. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you.